e ngā mana, e ngā iwi, ka huri ngā mihi ki a koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Blair, and I am the director of a company called Upflow in New Zealand, which is a geothermal science uh, research and consultancy business. And I am the new president of the International Geothermal Association. So I appreciate your support uh, during my time as president. And I'm privileged to serve you all in our global push towards more geothermal. Uh, good afternoon to you all and all of my friends and colleagues in Indonesia. I've always experienced fantastic hospitality every time I visited. So it's a shame I can't be there in person, but I'm very pleased that during this crazy time, we can still connect through this virtual event. So congratulations to the organizing committee uh, for organizing this event. So my talk today is focusing on how the people of New Zealand are benefiting from geothermal energy and specifically our indigenous peoples, Māori. Next, please. So this is a whakatauki, which in Māori is a saying, which is hei kai ke akuringa, which means there's food at the ends of my hands. And what that means is we should all use our abilities and the resources around us to ensure that we are prosperous. So we should look to our resources, which are our people and our environment, and create prosperity for all of us. Next, please. So the Indigenous peoples of New Zealand are called Māori. They are what's called tangata whenua, the people of the land. And Māori have a social structure which is based around tribe, uh, iwi, sub-tribe, hapu, and Fano, which is family. Next, please. Not too fast. <laughs> so the people of New Zealand, the Māori, uh, have a very powerful role in society in New Zealand that is recognised in legal and constitutional law. Um, Māori are approximately 16% of the population and 70% of that, those people are less than 40 years old. So we have a young Māori population in New Zealand. The Māori economy is very long, large and strong in New Zealand and it's estimated to be worth greater than $50 billion, that's New Zealand dollars. So you can see by the small symbols there on the left of the presentation, uh, that demonstrates the asset classes that are owned by Māori organisations in New Zealand. So you can see that there is significant investment in forestry uh, and farming and fishing and other resources. Next, please. So there is a fundamental guiding principle that Māori have, and that's called kaitiakitanga. And what kaitiakitanga is, it basically means guardianship. So Māori believe that it is their purpose in life and their focus is to ensure that they look after the resources and that is not just uh, water and air and environmental things, but also people for future generations so that future generations can prosper from the land and resources. Uh, next, please. So in New Zealand, on the left-hand side of this slide, I hope it's the left-hand side for you, 
is a map of the North Island of New Zealand. And in the close-up, we can see the Topol Volcanic Zone. So where all the high temperature geothermal systems are mainly hosted in New Zealand. And in that area, a significant proportion of the land is owned by Māori. This was a natural migration path for Māori in New Zealand. And about 30% of all Māori assets in New Zealand exist within the Topol Volcanic Zone. The first use of geothermal energy in New Zealand was by Māori for bathing. No, I haven't finished yet. Need to go back one. Um, was finished. Uh, the first geothermal use in New Zealand was for bathing, um, spiritual ri uh, rituals, medicinal and cooking. And Māori have welcomed visitors to geothermal sites for over 200 years. And that's a long time in New Zealand's history. In New Zealand, we have our geothermal systems have a classification whereby our regulators have deemed them to be available for development or limited development or they're protected. And they may be protected for reasons such as there is traditional use there uh, for tourism or other reasons that they should not be developed for electricity generation. And what that does is it balances the ways in which communities value geothermal in their lives and, and their activities. Uh, next, please. So another important thing to consider is that in New Zealand, geothermal consents are based on water take. So it's not mining um, like some other countries, it's on volumes of fluid of water. So anybody in New Zealand can get a permit to take water. However, they must have agreement from the landowner to access that fluid on their lands. So this forces an engagement between Māori landowners and developers and creates the opportunity for Māori to participate in geothermal developments in a meaningful way. So most geothermal projects in New Zealand, most fields have commercial arrangements between Māori landowners and uh, generators and they may also be generators themselves. Such things as fuel supply agreements, uh, royalties, lease agreements, those sorts of things. And there are, there are four types of uh, participation that groups can have, and we see this across the world. Um, and you see the little graph at the bottom, the little diagram at the bottom of my uh, presentation slide. There are four types of participation. There is consideration, which means that groups that are creating projects consider others and local um, groups. There is, the next step up is consultation. So developers consult with groups and have discussions. The next one is passive participation, which means that Local groups may be beneficiaries from developments, geothermal developments in their region, meaning they get monies or resources. And the highest level of engagement is active participation. And that's where we see local communities and groups being partners in development. And the, the diagram demonstrates that increasing participation up those levels increases acceptance by local communities for geothermal projects. And in New Zealand, we have across the spectrum of those things, and luckily, lots at the top around the active participation space. So, next please. So I just want to talk about one specific group as a case study, a group called Tohara North Number Two Trust. And this was a Māori trust that has approximately 800 owners and 9,000 descendants. And their purpose, the trust purpose, is to improve the health and well-being of their peoples. 
and make sure that they are providing for the future generations and being strong kaitiaki. Tohara North number two has significant investment in geothermal electricity generation projects. They are partners with Mercury, formerly Mighty River Power in New Zealand. They own 35% of Naawa Parua Power Station, which is a 138 megawatt, megawatt uh, single shaft, triple flash geothermal turbine from Fuji Electric. Um, and they also have a 50% stake in another power station, Natamariki and Rotokawa. So they are owners of projects and they have significant revenue, which they spend millions of dollars every year on well-being programs for their descendants, uh, education grants, uh, health programs, sports and cultural um, activities, and they are really leaders in in Maori participation in geothermal and indigenous peoples in, in indigenous in geothermal projects around the world. And we know that Maori, so we have Maori are really active in development roles in geothermal in New Zealand, and especially direct use geothermal where they are the innovators and at the forefront. And why are they so interested in direct use? Next slide, please. So here is a graph. I apologize if that's really small writing. Here is a table which outlines a few of the large industrial geothermal direct use projects in New Zealand. And on the left-hand side is the name of the project and description of the activity, what they do there, the size of the operation, how much energy is used. And then at the very right of the table, we see a, a number there, FTE, full-time equivalent. So we can see that those are significant numbers. So in New Zealand, we know that industrial direct pro, uh, use projects have significant impact on employment wherever they are and the majority actually all of these projects are located in very small towns of uh, Taupo is uh, 40,000 people or less with high percentage Maori populations so these projects are supporting rural uh, small communities and significantly uh, increasing prosperity for Māori communities. We know that geothermal direct use projects are, are good for employment, and the majority of our projects are, are brownfield projects whereby the cost to access the fluid is done first by electricity generation projects. So next, please. So we want to drive more investment in direct use projects in New Zealand. And so in 2017, uh, we developed a geoheat strategy for New Zealand and every year to 2030. And we have action plans every two years on what we're going to do to do that. And you can get a copy of those on that website that I've just written under there, nzgeoheat.org.nz, if you want to have a look at the action plans and the strategy. The goal is to have an increase in, by 7.5 petajoules um, of additional direct use uh, energy and 500 new jobs. And in New Zealand, 500 jobs is significant. So next slide, please. I just want to talk about um, how we're thinking about these projects and how to find successful projects. We've found that when we look at the co-location of resources and geothermal and put them together, uh, that's where projects are successful. So on the left-hand side, we see a map of the total volcanic zone and the bright colors, the red and the yellows, are the high temperature geothermal fields and the green layer over the top is our forestry estate. So where all our 
uh, commercial forests are in New Zealand. And so you can see a natural alignment between forestry and geothermal. And so we have significant number of wood processing uh, projects in New Zealand. And we embed the benefits of geothermal in our wood pro products. So on the right, that photo there, that is a photo of Kawaro. And Kawaro is accounts for about 56% of industrial ge direct use geothermal in New Zealand um, and has significant timber drying and pulp and paper product processing. Next. Along the forestry theme, this is a company called Tenon. They are based in, in Taupo and they moved to geothermal uh, for their kiln drying in 2006. They have about 265 employees. They have significantly ramped that up recently. And when they moved from gas to geothermal, they significantly reduced the amount of CO2 that they were emitting to the atmosphere. They reduced their operating costs by millions of dollars and they increased their drying capacity by 5%. And so we see that that move, there are multiple benefits of using geothermal and wood processing. Next slide. One of those, which is not a small thing, um, we can see demonstrated here by a company called Asalio. And Asalio provide tissue um, products and toilet paper in New Zealand. So we have geothermal toilet paper in New Zealand, which isn't that great. Um, and we can see that when in 2010, Asalio moved from gas boilers on the left-hand side of the screen to using geothermal, they reduced 46% of their greenhouse gas emissions. So we know in New Zealand that by bringing geothermal energy and heat into our processing, uh, we can de decarbonise our economy. Next. Ah, Kauro. It's a toilet paper maker's paradise. The ground here's full of steam. So Purex use it to help power their factory. They use sustainable forests. Oh, just look at them grow. And the view from the tea room's not too bad either. Yep, if you want to make toilet paper that's not only soft, but soft on the environment, Kawaro's a pretty good place to do it. Purex, made here in New Zealand for more than 60 years. So we can see that our, I hope you like that video, we can, you can see that our manufacturers here in New Zealand really understand the benefits and talk about it in their advertising to uh, users here in New Zealand. Next, please. So here's another group that is really impressive, a Māori uh, company called Miraka, and Miraka is the Māori word for milk. So Miraka, established in 2011, they were profitable within one year of operation. So you look at the significant investment that they made and in profit after one year. They have high environmental and ethical standards. They embed their cultural values in their operation. So they demand high levels of environmental practice and they will also pay a premium for that. So Miraka is a premium uh, milk drying facility where they produce milk powders and long life milk for markets, mainly in Asia. They have a Vietnamese partner that they deal with, but mainly uh, throughout Asia. And they use on average 20 tons per hour of steam at about 27 bar. Um, they need about three megawatts of power to operate and they run through a steam clean process where they degas, condense and send fluid to the factory. So Miraka is a great demonstration of geothermal and Māori innovation. Next, please. Oh, and, and that's what cows look like in New Zealand. <laughs> They're quite happy. Next, please. 
So here we see how the Māori values of no waste and using the resources um, us fit into an integrated system. If you look closely at the bottom left of the screen, you can see Miraka, which is the, the milk drying facility. And up to the right, you can see the geothermal power station. So electricity and steam go to Miraka to dry the milk and the waste residues go to a worm farm, which is a commercial worm farm that they sell worms and, and products uh, commercially. And also at the top, you can see there's a dairy operation, which the cows send their milk to Miraka. So there's a really awesome integrated use and thinking, holistic thinking in uh, a Māori sphere here in New Zealand. There's a smart, no waste focus. Next, please. So there's a lot of words here. Don't worry, I won't read all the words. Um, what we know creates successful community engagement in New Zealand is that it's all based around trust and that long-term relationships are really important. So we know that geothermal projects are you know, here at Wairake, 50, 60, 70 years old, and Māori are thinking in 100-year terms, they're thinking about the next generation. So geothermal and Indigenous peoples have aligned thinking about long-term resource use and management. Um, so we know that it's important that everybody wins uh, in local communities and developers for sustainability and that there is genuine engagement. People truly are interested in outcomes beneficial to all. And we can see the benefits here in New Zealand of those relationships. Next, please. And now we're starting to share our experiences with others. Uh, we had a group from New Zealand over the last couple of years engaged by the United States Energy Association that visited uh, Kenya and worked with the Maasai and Kenjin at Alkaria to work together to create a framework where the groups can move together into the future. And we had representatives from a Māori Trust here in New Zealand and also a developer, a ge electricity generator, and they went and have spent time with each other and helped develop a, a forward path for both groups to move forward into the future and hopefully have mutual beneficial success. And next, please. So that is my short, hopefully on time, talk. Um, if you have further questions for me that you want to ask that we don't resolve today, please connect with me on LinkedIn and I will help. I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, I encourage you all to keep pushing geothermal forward. It's important for our world. Uh, thank you again for the invite. I wish you all well. Stay safe out there. I look forward to seeing you in person somewhere sometime. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi, I am Muhammad Permadi Sugiharto. Hopefully we are all given help during this pandemic. Don't forget about the protocol. And hopefully this pandemic will end soon. I mean. First of all, I want to say thank you to ATB International Geotoma Workshop for giving me the opportunity to share my paper with title the implementation of flow performance tests to monitor well performance in geothermal field. I will introduce my colleagues who contribute to make this paper. They are Fadil Evan Manastio, Ahmad Fahmi Fanani, Pak Fernando Pasaribu, Pak Marihot Silaban, Pak Dimas Taha Maulana, and Buneni Meriani Saptaji. The outline of this presentation is the follow. The first is introduction. This part explains the definition of FPT, location of case studies, 
background, objective, and location of well. The second is method. This is explain the method from the schematic side and the equation used to create the uh, deliverability curve. The third is case study. This is explain the FPT implementation process and it is result in three well which will be discussed in this paper. The fourth is conclusion and the fifth is recommendation. Afterward is a further action explain what things can be done after FPT. And the last one is acknowledge. Flow performance test is one of the method or measurement solution of the flow rate taken on the time the production well supplying steam to power plant, especially in two-phase geothermal field, which has separator to separate the fluid. The FPT work implementation are as follow. This method is carried out when the well operates to supply steam to power plant. This method can be done at the time when the power generation is reduced because of excess power in network or maintenance in power plant. It has very short implement implementation time. It's uh, for until five hours for each point. Next about the location. In this paper, the field as a place to implement this method is located on Sumatra Island in the province of Lampung, namely the Ulubulu field. Ulubulu field has been operating since 2012. There are uh, 56 wells which are 31 production wells, 14 range and wells, 10 monitoring wells, and three temporary abandoned. The Ulubulu field has a reservoir temperature is 250 until 280 Celsius degree. And the production zone is in the north and the reaction zone is in the south. Currently, uh, UBL has operating 220 megawatts capacity from four power plant units. Unit one and two are operated by PLN, while unit three and four are operated by PGE. The background why FPT activity is needed is because of, because of the need for monitoring well production profile that is useful to know change in the well character characteristic. However, because the field might have limited steam buffer and to do production tests must shut down the power plant system. So this method is used to cover this problem. In this case study, the FET data is validated by TFT data. Although it may occur, occur because another factor as borehole problem and surface facility problem. The objective of this paper is to know the change in well production characteristic by monitoring steam flow during well productions. And the location of the research well is in cluster D for UBL 52 and cluster J for UBL J2 and UBL 54. Next about method in the schematic. Among the factor involved are well head pressure, separator pressure, level of water in the separator, steam flow rate, and the brain flow rate. For the preparation procedure is as follow. Check all the matter connecting directly with the data needed and cal calibrate if needed. Check the access of steam or available risk of steam. Check valve condition that related to the work. Check the opening valve position in the well related to the tested well. Then the FPT process can be done as follow. Close throttle valve well A to raise the well head pressure 
of tested well in according with the program. Plus the steam valve to maintain separator pressure in accordance with the condition before test. Close brain valve to adjust the fluid level in the separator. Close the throttle valve well B in the well that connected to the same separator with tested well. To keep the well head pressure in its initial condition, usually after steam in the separator is greatly reduced due to the reduced steam production from the tested well. And monitor the steam reduction that occurred as a result of the steam reduction in tested well. FET similar with production separation test, uh, FET running under operation conditions, the output curve will be more representative from the individual operation test because of the interference effect will be more visible. <clears throat> and the data for detonating transition flow test and horizontal production test. The availability curve is constructed from the production rate in various uh, wellhead pressure by using empirical equations. That is James equation from Russell James and parabolic equation which, which from mathematical parabolic equation by substitute well production flow rate and well head, well head pressure parameter. Making a deliverability curve is done by matching FPT data with test two equation and choose which one is closer to the FPT data. Like the figure in the left side, you can see. The first case is UBL 52. Well, 52 as the tested well is marked yellow in the picture. While well, UBL 11 and separator were monitored, the picture show the brain line, steam line, and flow meter. If it is data, then construct with the equation, it turns out to be more matched using James equation. Then it is validated with the FP data and the deviation is only 1.4%. Then compared to the previous production test data, it appears that after operating for one year, it still seems unstable. It may be overproduction or interference with the other wells in the same cluster. The second case study is UBL J2. UBL J2 as tested well is marked yellow in the picture, while UBL J1, UBL 54, and separato were monitored. Plometer is located after central separato. We cannot see in the picture here. FPT data then construct with the equation, it turned out to be more matched using parabolic equation. Then it is validated with production test data and the deviation is 2.7%. The third case study is UBL 54. UBL 54, as tested well, is marked yellow in the picture. UBL 54 does not use FPT, but threshold flow test with three times of data retrieval with different health pressure. TFT data then construct with the equation, it turned out to be more matching using the James equation. This third study aims to compare the use of both equation with the FT and FPT data. It is more beneficial to use FPT than TFT because TFT is costly. But TFT is also important because it is used as a data validation. Then compared with the previous production test data, it can be seen after operating for until five months, it still seems unstable. It may be overproduction or interfering with the other wells in the same cluster. And this is the conclusion. First, FPT program implemented in 
Bulu Bulu field was validated by TFT and production test data, which the deviation result vary from one until three percent. Second, OBL52 and UBL54 data still looking for stable performance during four months until one year of operation. Although there are possibilities due to offer production and or interference effect from another wells in the same cluster. Third, in UBL J2, there is not noticeable difference in characteristic between production tests and FPT data. And four, FPT is cheaper than TFT and cheaper than horizontal production tests, which needs production testing facility. The other benefit, FPT does not have to shut down production wells from the supply system to the power plant. From this research, the recommendation is the, the FPT should be applied as a solution to acquire production wells data on a regular basis in accordance to company work plan. Why this method is highly recommended? Because by monitoring change in the characteristics of well production, we can mitigate well problem. If we look uh, at the pattern of production uh, profile in figure one, illustrate the next change due to the pressure drop. In figure two, illustrate the entropy has large effect on maximum discharge pressure and smaller effect on total mass at lower wellhead pressure. In figure three, it can be shown that there is no change in maximum discharge pressure, uh, must change in flow rate at a uh, lower wellhead pressure. In figure four, after updating characteristic of each production well, we can forecasting production decline in several years and plan further action for well problem mitigation such as perform makeup well, hole cleaning, or remedial. So uh, this brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, I, will, I would like to seriously thank to Pertamina Geothermal Energy for permission to publish this paper. Thank you to the reservoir management team at the exploitation division for their support. Thank you to the to the operation division team at the Ulu Blue Field, which involved in daily acquisition of products and parameters data. Thank you for your attention. Geothermal energy is a relatively environmentally friendly source of energy. It is derived from the heat of the earth. In recent years, the market for geothermal power has increased sharply, especially in emerging markets due to the economic growth due to the growing number of communities in low-income rural areas that have access to the power grid. Any governments are also increasing focus to reduce the dependency on expensive fossil fuels and not environmentally friendly. Sistraco Group is a company engaged in the energy sector. Established in 1995, Sistraco Group is currently very focused to be able to develop and serve you in various needs related to the geothermal sector, which among of them are, whole cleaning services. Sistraco Group provides comprehensive conventional fishing tools and systems include packer milling and retrieving, internal and external cutting, internal and external engagement, washover, basically every fishing application. Regardless of what's in your well, hence are we've removed it successfully. We also provide a radial cutting torch that is safe and without any explosives or harmful chemical elements that can cut the tubular drilling equipment left in the well. As well, biochemical that can scale control, corrosion control, cooling water treatment and also as a rig washer. Downhole camera. Leveraging the advancement of technology today, 
Sistrico Group also provides high-resolution downhole camera equipment and clear image quality and capable of operating up to a depth of 2,000 meters, adding to our line of services to focus on the development of the geothermal sector. Geothermal Well Testing Energy Megaperseta as the sister company of Sistrico Group also provides the services of geothermal well testing, real-time well monitoring, geoscience. Digital Remote Sensing Use Sniffer 4D Drone Digital Remote Sensing System has an advanced capability to detect and map for the following energy sector applications, steam surface breakout monitoring, well reliability and integrity monitoring, air quality mapping, well surveillance and inactive well management, geothermal associated gases detector and mapping. All of which are focused to support activities in the geothermal sector. Please. Do not hesitate to contact us when you need our support, because we are there for our common progress. Thank you very much. Good day everybody, my name is Eric Firanda. Here I would like to present on my presentation. Topic is about a modified non-isothermal lamp parameter model for geothermal reservoir. I present this uh, at ITB International Geothermal Workshop. Where here uh, I'm as the author and three co-authors, Fernando Pasaribu, Sutopo, and Heru. This is the outline of my presentation. The introduction, uh, there is the objective, and then there is the basic theory and methodology, and then uh, case study, result and discussion, and the last is a uh, conclusion. Introduction, the mass balance in uh, geothermal, where mass balance is the the most important knowledge in geothermal. So I will explain about this uh, in the next uh, slide. And the second is the uh, geothermal uh, has unique characteristic versus the reservoir temperature is the main factor followed by uh, reservoir probability and the pressure. So when we have the high temperature, so we can produce the steam or the fluid and we can as the power for the power plant and then a decrease in temperature uh, will result a decrease enthalpy which affect the capacity of the well this is the objective of my uh, presentation the predict geothermal performance along the production life and then uh, we can calculate heat and mass balance for the non-isothermal condition with pressure and temperature change. And then we can also predict the movement of the fluid from wellhead to the turbine. So this is the basic theory and methodology. First is we have the reservoir mechanism because the fluid movement uh, in the reservoir and we have also well bore fluid mechanism where is uh, this is the our reservoir we know uh, pressure is here is the uh, reservoir pressure and by this pressure and by the different pressure the pressure is uh, make the fluid movement from the boundary to the or from the reservoir to the well bore or we we know as the pressure of uh, well flowing because the the difference of pressure fluid can uh, flow to the well bore and in the well bore there is the pressure drop to the surface and we can produce the steam or the brine it's depend on the driving mechanism of our reservoir after a while we have the surface fluid mechanism and also we have uh, power generation here uh, in the surface uh, the fluid when we have the water dominated reservoir or field we uh, have the aspirator to separate uh, steam and brine and then the brine we inject again 
and the steam we can flow to the uh, turbine and this is the uh, how the reservoir mechanism of the fluid we know the darcy equation uh, describe the porous media this is a uh, w w is the mass for mass rate for the uh, water and this is the steam mass rate the w and we know the parameters uh, that affected uh, this uh, mass rate first is uh, solute probability and then there is the relative probability and also the thickness the reservoir pressure well flowing pressure and also uh, mu or viscosity we have the encouragement and we also wear reduce and we also have the skins and this is the uh, density of the water and here uh, similar to the, uh, the steam and for this relative probability of water and also for the steam we have the uh, relative probability curve is like this next uh, this is the mass and heat balance or we call as the lump parameter we know uh, this is as our reservoir there are a uh, water steam uh, volume porosity and heat in our reservoir and we have also the heat source uh, support the the temperature or the heat to our reservoir we have also the recharge and we also have the uh, heat rejected from the brine or the densat wells and then uh, we produce from the producer well and we have the the heat loss it lost to the uh, the rock the environment here we we i i mean the uh, surrounding rock so we can calculate the cumulative mass when we have the mass rate from the darcy equation we can also uh, can calculate the cumulative mass we can use uh, trapezoidal methods to calculate this and we can combine with the heat balance when here, here is what we produce. This is the vapor or steam. And here the W is for the water. And we have uh, the loss. So how to convert from the cumulative mass to, to make the heat? We just multiply by the enthalpy H here. So uh, this uh, equation equals to uh, what happened in the our reservoir is like a difference of pressure it's mean that some expansion and uh, can also have the injection as uh, uh, sorry we have the reinjection here and we have the cumulative or the recharge and we have the heat of the heat source well bore and surface fluid mechanism in the well the the fluid rise up along the borehole to the surface or we call as the well head pressure following uh, the law of conservation of energy and also occur in surface piping uh, using the equation be, uh, the pressure drop uh, affected by gravity uh, acceleration and also the friction and uh, we know that uh, currently uh, there are many uh, correlation such as Lockhart Martinelli Harrison Freston, Don and Rose, H. Don and Brown, Arkizewski, and Reflap. For the power generation, we have the PES diagram, temperature and uh, entropy. We uh, the number here, here one represent the reservoir condition or the in the well. We have uh, increasing the dryness, and we until the surface here the surface condition at well, well head increasing the dryness and then uh, three in uh, sparator and uh, here separated uh, the steam and uh, the brine and the steam going to the fourth number here and uh, steam in the turbine uh, convert to the energy using this equation which with is the efficiency and 
m is the uh, mass rate we have the delta of uh, our difference different between the enthalpy in here and here so we can use the entropy equation uh, where the enthalpy of the steam here is equal with the uh, enthalpy is uh, here six action and then uh, we can know the x x is uh, the dryness where and we can calculate the enthalpy and we use this uh, equation so so this is the case study we use uh, five well example this is so many data here uh, like uh, absolute probability relative probability to steam and also uh, the correlation between the relative probability to the uh, saturation and then we have uh, other parameters and this is uh, the result the discharge re, uh, present or describe the mass rate and uh, the time we uh, simulate or cal calculate for uh, 30 years here we can see the the mass rate uh, is going down and the brown this line is the atom hole brine flow rate and here is the head brine this bottom hole this is the well head because the 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 amount of the brine uh, decrease because uh, the dryness uh, increase in here but for the steam for the uh, at well head uh, this the steam uh, increase but uh, in the uh, reservoir or the bottom hole the steam flow rate uh, is zero but uh, here uh, the line little bit uh, straight line because the reservoir pressure uh, decrease uh, not too high this is the the result we can see this is the our reser reservoir pressure in the <coughs> initial uh, 43 and then uh, going down to the uh, 42.2 it's why the the grab the grab of the mass rate uh, not too significant going down and then uh, uh, we have the reservoir uh, temperature we assume as the isothermal so we can also uh, there are so many parameters that we can predict uh, here like the uh, the dryness in separator is uh, 0 or uh, 11% uh, increase from the well head. It means that the, uh, the steam uh, increase uh, from here to here is the increase of the uh, amount of the steam and we can uh, calculate the power the megawatt is about uh, 5.7 and at the end of prediction the end of simulation the power only remains uh, 5.9 this is the example or or the result for well one and then for the well two grab is uh, like this uh, similar to first uh, well so it's also going down but actually this is not the the straight line uh, from here we can uh, see here uh, the reservoir temperature is not isothermal from initial 244 celsius and going down to uh, 236 uh, Celsius the simulation for the 30 years and we can uh, calculate the power uh, 6.9 to 5 uh, megawatt so from here we can see the uh, well head pressure is also going down this because we know that uh, 
the decrease of reservoir temperature so make the the well head pressure uh, going down so uh, this is the conclusion of my uh, presentation uh, first is the non isothermal lamp parameter has uh, been developed and it can be applied for ablating geothermal reservoirs and then the new equation has considered many aspects that affect fluid mechanism from reservoir to power generation such as Darcy equation in porous media fluid mechanism equation to no pressure drop in wellbore from bottom hall to well head and also the pressure drop in pipeline and can calculate power generation or we we are familiar with the megawatts of the production and this uh, uh, paper is also applicable to consider uh, mass reinjection, recharge, uh, heat loss, and uh, heat source. Okay, uh, that is uh, all of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Indonesia merupakan salah satu negara yang memiliki potensi energi panas bumi terbesar di dunia. Saat ini, Indonesia menduduki peringkat dua dunia sebagai negara penghasil listrik dari energi panas bumi. Selain sebagai energi yang bersih dan berkelanjutan, peran energi panas bumi sebagai base load penyediaan listrik menjadi pertimbangan utama agar pengembangannya diprioritaskan. Oleh karena itu, dalam menjaga ketahanan energi suatu negara, Energi panas bumi dapat menjadi andalan untuk memasok listrik guna memenuhi target bauran energi 23% EBT di tahun 2025, sesuai dengan amanat dari kebijakan energi nasional. Untuk memenuhi pencapaian target EBT, dalam bauran energi tersebut, Indonesia layak melakukan percepatan pembangunan proyek PLTP di Indonesia. PT Geodipa Energi Persero adalah perusahaan yang bergerak di bidang energi panas bumi mulai dari eksplorasi hingga eksploitasi. Perusahaan didirikan pada tanggal 5 Juli tahun 2002. Kemudian pada tahun 2011, melalui peraturan pemerintah nomor 62 tahun 2011, Geodipa ditetapkan sebagai persero yang pengawasan dan pembinaannya berada di bawah Kementerian Keuangan dan PT PLN Persero, yang juga merupakan salah satu Special Mission Vehicle atau SMV di bawah Kementerian Keuangan dengan misi mendukung program pemerintah dalam penyediaan listrik tenaga panas bumi yang aman dan ramah lingkungan serta memberikan manfaat besar kepada Indonesia. Geodipa siap untuk melanjutkan pengembangan proyek PLTP di Yang Patuha yang masuk dalam Fast Track Program atau FTP tahap 2 10.000 MW. Bagian dari program 35.000 MW yang merupakan program pemerintah di bidang pembangunan infrastruktur ketenaga listrikan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ricky Prabowo from Institut Teknologi Bandung and PT PLN Persero. Today at ITB International Geothermal Workshop 2020, I want to present my research paper with the title Study of Increased Geothermal Well Production Rate with Downhill Pump Installation for Utilization in Power Plant. The authors of the paper are Ricky Prabowo, Neni Miryani Saptaji, Dimas Taha Maulana, and Yoda Yudhishthira Nusya Putra from Institute Technology Bandung and PT PLN Persero. First, the outline of my presentation First one is introduction, the background why I choose the topic. Second, well condition and characteristic based on well testing. The third, a pressure depth calculation and inflow performance relationship. Fourth is downhole pump calculation. Fifth, RC power plant calculation. And the last one is conclusion of the research. First, the, let's start with the introductions. Geothermal well is one of the main components of geothermal utilizations. 
while category based on capability of produced geothermal fluid flow to surface divided into self-discharge and non-self-discharge. Self-discharge, the well with high permeability, high pressure, and high temperature. Non-self-discharge divided into several conditions. First, with high permeability and high temperature but low pressure. It will become easier because if there is boiling at bottom hole, it will push the fluid flow into the surface. And other non-self-discharge divided into some condition based on parameter of permeability, pressure, and temperature. The well with low pressure, low permeability, and low temperature will become dry well. The well with low permeability but high pressure and high temperature need well stimulation, which is the methods are oxidizing and hydraulic fracturing to open the fracture and increase the permeability. The well with high permeability but low pressure and low temperature need artificialist method, which is one of them is downhole pump installations. Geothermal well with high permeability, low pressure, and low temperature, there is into Lehu field. So that is this necessary to make study of downhole pump installation in this well. Downhole pump divided into land shaft pump and electrical submersible pump. The main difference is the position of the motor. LSP, the position of the motor at the surface and electrical submersible pump, the position of the motor deep into the well. The advantages of LSP are higher motor efficiency because motor operates in air, higher temperature capability, and generally lower purchase price than ESP. The ESP have advantages are usually higher speeds, deeper setting for installation, and less installation and pump up all time. Then we move to well condition and characteristic of X1 well. X1 well drilled in 2017 and directional drilling to predicted permeable zone at Banda Fault and Banda Hatua Fault. The depth of the well is 1,700 meter depth with kickoff point 350 meter. The well is standard hole with production casing diameter 9.58 inch and production line diameter 8.5 inch. Several well testing have been done on X1 geothermal well. Water loss test that will give identify fit zone, gross permeability test, and pressure fallout test that will give the value of EGTVDS and permeability thickness that will describe the permeability of the well, heat up test that will give pressure and temperature profile and maximum temperature of the well, and the production test will give well deliverability curve that describes the capability of well to produce geothermal fluid. Based on the well testing result, we get the well condition and characteristics of X1 well. The maximum temperature is 139 degrees Celsius. Permeability thickness is 16.5 decimeter. And the production mass flow rate, based on the production test, mass flow rate 11.70x until 38.8 kg per second at well head pressure 2.6 until 3.17 bar. So the S1 geothermal well have characteristics with high permeability, low pressure, and low temperature. So it is suitable to downhole pump installation in this well. And then we make pressure drop calculation and info performance relationship. Based on well geometry and schematic, we get the value of production casing diameter, production line diameter, fit zone at 750 meter, and reservoir pressure at 67 bar. We make pressure drop calculation with homogeneous correlation and we get the value of pressure well flowing. After that, we make the IPR curve. Based on the static pressure and temperature by heating up test, it indicates that the reservoir is saturation liquid. And we have reservoir pressure. We have also value of productivity index. We try some value of pressure well flowing we get mass flow rate and we make the curve to describe the correlation between pressure work flowing and the mass flow rate. And the IPR curve will be need to determine optimal mass flow rate at several value of pump setting depth in downhole pump calculation. Then we move to section of pump calculation. First, we choose downhole pump type Best one of the parameter that will be considered is production casing diameter. Production casing diameter of X1 well is 9.58 inches, and the minimum well casing diameter for LSP is 13.3 inches, for ESP, 4.5 inches. Based on 
This data production casing diameter S1 well, the suitable Dano pump type is electrical submersible pump or ESP. And then we make pump calculation for, we try some value of pump setting depth from 500 until 600 depth because uh, the pump setting depth usually 200 above the fit zone. And then we get the mass flow rate and pressure well flowing based on IPR curve with the limitation pump section pressure must be higher than boiling pressure. We also make calculation for total dynamic height consists of net water lift, friction loss, and well head discharge pressure. So we get the value of mass flow rate and total dynamic height for each pump setting depth. Then we make ESP type selection based on the requirement of minimum well casing and optimum range based on ESP manufacturer catalog with the optimal mass flow rate from 19,000 barrel per day until 24,000 barrel per day and production casing size 9.58 inches. There, there are two types of ESP selected based on those conditions, ESP1 and ESP2. And then we plot mass flow rate value on pump performance curve. We get pump efficiency, head per state, and brake horse power per state for ESP1 and ESP2. Well, we make calculation for total stats requires and brake horsepower calculation. We get for the ESP1 total stats require 52 stages and brake horsepower 420.71 kilowatt. And for ESP2 total stats require 41 stages with brake horsepower 69.36 kilowatt. And then we try those calculation for each pep setting depth. We get the correlation deep, deeper pump setting depths will give higher mass flow rate but also higher brake horse power. It also happened in the ESP2. And we will choose the suitable pump setting depth by net power output value after the RC power plant calculation is finished. Then we move to RC power plant calculation. This is the RC schematic. And then we have some assumption for the calculation based on the previous calculation. Pressure is three bar, brine temperature 138 degrees Celsius, mass flow rate 44.86 kilogram per second. And we have also the value, we have also the value for turbine efficiency, feed pump efficiency, pressure efficiency, then and effort operator efficiency. And the calculation with thermodynamic concept for each stage that will use axle that combine with refrop. After we have done the calculation for each stage, we find the optimal condition by, by uh, use some value for turbine inlet pressure and condenser pressure. For example, with butane working fluid, the optimal condition is at turbine inlet pressure 15.26 bar and condenser pressure 2.7 bar. And then we have we also try some working fluids. Based, the working fluids is chosen based on technical aspect and environmental aspects. And we make the calculation for the optimal condition for each working fluid. We compare and we get the highest RC power output and thermal efficiency is RC power plant model with Bhutan working fluid. So in this research, we choose Bhutan working fluid as the working fluid in RC power plant. Then we make calculation net power output with Bhutan working fluid for each pump setting depth. And we get the correlation, the deeper pump setting depth will give higher net power output for our power plant with ESP1 and ESP2. Our power plant with ESP1 give the net power output 937.37 kilowatt. And our power plant with ESP2 give net power output 1288.72 kilowatt. And then after we finish the RC power plant calculation, we get the conclusion of the research. First, S1 geothermal well have characteristics that with high permeability, low pressure, and low temperature. Therefore, therefore the implementation of downhole pump is suitable for this well. And then the second one, downhole pump type suitable with S1 well condition and characteristic is ESP1 and ESP2 based on the manufacturer catalog that will produce geothermal fluid mass flow rate 44.86 kg per second at optimal pump setting depth 600 meter. 
or C model at optimal condition with Bhutan working fleet will produce net power output 0.94 megawatt until 1.28 megawatt for ORC combined with ESP1 and ESP2. That's all my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, okay. uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your attendance in this presentation. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Raja Mukti. I just graduated from ITB Geothermal Master Program. On this occasion, I will discuss about performance evaluation of geothermal power producer using ES. This body, Ulumbu Geothermal Power Producer, Unit 4, Nusa Tenggara Timur, Indonesia. <coughs> The outline of this presentation is divided into six parts. And the first is introduction, and then the second is methods. The third is price cycle condensing turbine. And the next is fluid equation model in ES. And the result in discussion. And the last one is compression. Okay, introduction. Uh, Ulumbu Geotema Working Area is located in Flores, Nusa Tenggara Timur. In the location, there are four uh, geothermal power plant. And the research is conducted in Unit 4. Ulumbu Unit 4 has a capacity around 2.5 megawatt. And it uses dry spin cycle condensing turbine. And the turbine is designed with Turbine inlet pressure around 11 bar, and then the specific uh, steam consumption after construction is 9.8 ton per megawatt. And then the SSA average during operation in 2019 uh, average is 10.04 ton per megawatt. Uh, Ulumbu unit uh, 4 is supplied. Uh, Team from ULP or two production well. The condition in 2011 uh, production test uh, for Ulumbu unit 2 is well high pressure is 11 bar and then the temperature is 240 uh, degrees Celsius and it has a uh, steam as low from 117 to 75 pound per megawatt. The HCG content is 3%. And then uh, during 2019, uh, it is known that uh, the head pressure is reduced to 9.6 bar. And then the HCG uh, also decreased uh, become 2.2%.
in this study, uh, we are using the uh, method uh, we can show in the picture. The uh, method is in our research to evaluate the performance of Ulumbu Unit 4 uh, following this diagram. Firstly, uh, we study the trator and then uh, collecting data, for example, equipment specification, operational data, still finished data. And then we creating equation model in using ES mixture number 57086. And after this, we can execute the uh, equation model. And then the result, we can match the with the operation relation uh, or also the design. If it match, it is finished. And if not, we can uh, check the equation model. And then uh, this is this aluminum for heat balance diagram. Uh, we can see in this picture. It is simplified from design, uh, design drawing. The value of every parameter is same with the design. From the design, we uh, know that uh, SSG is around, one million unit 4 is around 8.2 uh, ton per megawatt. And with this uh, value, it can produce a cross generator power around uh, 2.5 megawatt until 3 megawatt. From the drawing, uh, the red mark is uh, represent the simple dry spin uh, cycle for geothermal. Number one is the spin come from the Ulumbu uh, ULP2 production well. And then number two is the turbine inlet. And then number three is uh, spin after expansion process in turbine. And then Number four is in a condensing condense in the condenser. From the drawing, we use the following equation to evaluate the system of Ulubu. For turbine, we refer to TPPO 2012. And then for the condenser, we refer in the book uh Mac 2002 and then for pump we can calculate this, this equation and then for the NCT ejector we adopt from Preston 1966 uh, it is have a some step firstly is uh, we call the environment ratio and then we on the air equivalent and then we call the compression ratio we see with this uh, equation. And then uh, on the next step is uh, express expansion ratio uh, using uh, this equation. equation. And then uh, next is our steam ratio. And then the end, we can get the value of motive steam, motive steam flow. And then from the cooling tower, uh, we use we use, uh, we refer to the two book. One is the two thousand and two, and then the for the cooling tower fan we refer to the per ninety eighty one. From for the SSC and power uh, cycle efficiency, we use this uh, equation. And then we write the equation in ES, uh, in equation window, like this, in the uh, red mark. It is uh, easy to using the ES because uh, the program language is same like we type the equation in office. So I think it's a simple, simple program, quite simple program for the ES. And then the calculation result in ES also could be shown in the diagram windows like this. 
the correction result uh, it is met uh, with the design for the ES, uh, SSC for calculation in the ES. We uh, result around 8.227 ton per megawatt. And then uh, kita tonet output uh, neto around 2,268 uh, kW. And then from the overall cycle efficiency, uh, we get a 11.93%. Well, for uh, generally, it is the same with the uh, design of the Ulumbu Unit 4. And then uh, we can also plot the temperature and entropy and uh, entropy RT, the NS diagram in for Ulumbu Unit 4. Uh, this is this the calculation uh, plotting the TS diagram for Ulumbu cycle is look like same with the S diagram for tri cycle uh, pattern. Uh, this uh, mark number one is uh, in left, uh, uh, sorry, before in that turbine, this is a uh, steam outlet from the scrapper, then in left to turbine, to the turbine in the point two, and then expansion 3S and 3, 3S is, uh, is entropies, and 3 is actual, and then the uh, process in point four. Then uh, this, uh, we try to vary the some uh, parameter uh, to know the effect of uh, to the generator output. Uh, we vary this is with we try to vary the mine steam flow in that to the turbine uh, with the uh, uh, pressure as keep same in around 11 bar 11 bar uh, as per design. And the result, uh, the simulation to uh, change the varying in the steam flow uh, to knowing the generator output is data cross maximum, we can get around 3,340 kilowatt at uh, maximum steam to steam flow around 7.63 uh, kilogram per second as per uh, maximum to be in that pressure, uh, in that uh, flow, uh, is aspect in the specification is 7.63 kilogram per second. But the uh, installed generator capacity in Ulumbu is only 3 megawatt or 3000 kilowatt. So, yeah, installed uh, generator maximum capacity. So with this condition, overall efficiency could be reached upon the Ulumbu is only 12.3% uh, uh, on this. Some reference uh, say that uh, for the reservoir that have uh, enthalpy around 2,800 uh, should be uh, and dry cycle. So the overall efficiency is around 60, around 70 percent, but uh, from the actual condition, so Ulumbu uh, still below the standard of, uh, efficiency. And uh, for the for the installed capacity of generator around 300 kilowatt, when we firing the inductor pin steam flow. Uh, it is does not uh, affect the change of SSG as long as uh, the perfect in the pressure keep a stable uh, at one value. For example, uh, if, uh, when the perfect in the pressure keep in around 11 bar, when we find the inner turbine steam flow, this not uh, change the uh, SSG. The SSG is the same as the constant in the 8.2 uh, ton per megawatt. Uh, with the, with uh, this condition, uh, using the installed uh, generator uh, capacity around through 3,000 3, kilowatt, well, the, if Ulumbu operated, operated, keep, keep operated with the uh, lead pressure 11 bar, the allowable electrical steam flow is around 
uh, 6.8 uh, kg per second because if it is uh, over the to the over the this value it will be the uh, in this one the is our generator we also to try to vary the uh, mc content uh, using para parametric table we change the we change the content of uh, LCG to now the effect to the of our uh, system, especially for generator outlet. Using a full operation data to simulate the change of LCG content, we know that every 1% change of, of uh, LCG content will affect uh, to the value of SSP around 0.1 per kilowatt. So if every change 1% of the uh, MCG, uh, it is uh, also uh, influenced to the SSG. Then, increasing MCG make the power of generator and of uh, uh, cycle efficiency is decreased because the uh, mix and copy between spin and MCG have a lower value compared with the pure steam. So, this is uh, still reasonable. And then for every 1% change of the MCG content, it will increase the overall spin required for Ulumbi Info about 5 until 7%. Uh, the increase is uh, uh, effect. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the increasing is uh, the crossing by uh, in case of uh, motive steam consumption. And then, uh, the thing of, uh, the things of, uh, pressure for, from the ULP2 position well, on that the pressure of the ULP2 is decreased uh, until 9.6 bar. So we try to change the token net pressure to get the generator net output uh, higher. We simulate uh, change the token net pressure uh, to respond the steam pressure supply from well that means uh, from the sun is 11 bar, become 9.6 bar. Uh, and then the, the result is in the net output maximum get at the total pressure 9.3 bar. In this condition, SSC is 9.17 bar per megawatt, and the overall efficiency is 10.39%. Uh, Compared with uh, to the operation, uh, at this data acquisition, the Ulumbu is affected in with the total net present around 8.6 uh, bar. At this, at this moment, uh, the overall efficiency is lower, uh, around 10.19%. On the research, uh, the conclusion we can conclude uh, first is AES simulation modeling based on simulation diagram and operation condition for Olympian 4 is has been clear. And the second one is the performance evaluation using the proposed model could be used for prediction SSC and uh, cycle efficiency with the variation of the in that pressure and CPU and CPU content. Then the third one is the decrease of CPU around 1% could affect to the SSC about 0.1 per megawatt. Then using the current compression condition, in order to get optimum generator output NATO, the inner turbine steam pressure should be set at 9.3 bar. Using this condition, the value of the S uh, of SSC and cycle efficiency will be 9.17 ton per megawatt and 10.39% respectively. 
If the turban in less temperature set uh, at this condition, a point set bar as determined during operation uh, during 2019, the the SSC and set will be 9.3 ton per megawatt and 10.90%. Uh, this is better than average SSA condition. Okay, uh, this uh, all for, for me. Thank you for the attention and goodbye. Hello everyone, my name is Mona. I am a geochemist in Sarula. Hope you are well during this pandemic. Today I will present my paper with title Scaling into Phase Pipeline, a study Sarula Geothermal Field. First, I would like to acknowledge Muhammad Andika, Saad Brutu, and Alexander Smith as my co-authors in this paper. This is the outline of my presentation. I divide this presentation into nine parts. First, introduction of several geothermal fields. Theory of silica scale occurred in geothermal facilities. Benchmark from other fields. Configuration and geochemistry of well in Sarula. Preliminary observation. Inspection of pipes. Discussion, summary, and last recommendation. Sarula Operations Limited, or SOL, is a consortium that has geothermal working area in North Tapanuri, North Sumatra, and currently operating three power plants. Each of them has 110 megawatts, with a total 330 megawatts. During the operation of facilities, there have been many challenges including scale problem in the production wells and surface piping. In this study, it will be focused on scale deposition in surface piping in the upstream area. The deposition causes a significant decrease in pipe diameter and also reduces power generation within three months of operation. Silica scale is a common problem in geothermal fields. Based on paper from Padilla, there are some parameters that control silica deposition, such as temperature of brine, concentration of, of dissolved silicon dioxide in brine, reservoir temperature, brine pH and salinity, presence of cations, such as magnesium and calcium, that can flocculate silica polymers, and accelerate healing. Based on brown, silica polymerization and deposition can be delayed at lower pH. As you can see at the right picture here, the monomeric silica stay higher at the 
lower pH rather than the neutral pH or higher pH. Other thoughts from Gallup and Hertz that metal silicate polymerize at higher temperature than amorphous silica. This is because the polymerization of amorphous silica is enhanced by the concentration of cation. The, the scale at two phase piping has been experienced before at later geothermal fields as they mix four production wells, two acidic wells, and two near neutral wells that has silica content above 500 ppm. The silica scale didn't occur at each of production wells or the individual well, although well three has oversaturated condition. But until they combine and mix as a single header, then the pH mixture is five, the silica scale was formed inside the collection header. This is the location of scale deposition in Sarula. Well pack A is located two kilometers away from the power plant. It consists of three production wells. Uh, all those wells, well one, two, and three, are merged into the same two page header, 36 inches. The scale was, the thicker scale started to form from the collection header or the two page header and into the surface facilities, other surface facilities, which marked in the yellow line here. We need to identify first the chemistry properties in each well. The continuous observation in the subject is essential since better understanding related to the chemistry is required. For well 1 and 3, it has near neutral pH around 6, and for well 2, it has acidic pH around 2.7. Before entering the mixing point, single well 2 is treated with caustic injection with target pH 5. It is started online from October 2018, and the purpose of this caustic was to to decrease the corrosion impact from acidic well. The fluid type of well 1 and 3 are chloride water, and fluid type for well 2 is chloride sulfate water. All wells are all in undersaturation condition. We noticed that there were decrease in flow rate observed in all wells in well pack A since the well 2 is, was gathered online from October 2018. Since then, the two phase flow rate in each well were decreased from 20 to 35 during seven months operation. Then in February 2019, there was a landslide occurred near well at A that made the pipe broken. The seam and brine flow must be temporarily closed, and during this time, inspection was done by opening the pipe from the MOP in individual well from well at A to the gathering line, and there was still found at from those surface facilities, including the two phase gathering. This is a picture inside the MOP in each well. For well one, it was relatively clean, and for well two and three, there was minor scale inside the pipe. Then the thicker scale started to occur at the mixing point of Three, three wells in the two piece header. The thickness of the scale reached around 15 centimeters in bottom and top. It has six to eight centimeter thickness in average, and it became more evenly distributed in subsequent sub surface facilities, include 
separator and accumulator. Then it was completely removed from the upstream to the downstream piping before put back online. Then, after repair for nearly two months, wells in Welter A put back online on April 2019. During three months operation until July 2019, significant reduction of flow rate and increase in wellhead pressure was developed again. Wellhead pressure increased around 40% and flow rate was decreased by 40% which also impact on generation reduction. Therefore, other inspections are needed to observe if there was healing deposit inside the pipe. In the second event, the inspection on July 2019, for, for, from the MOV in each well, well 1 was relatively clean, well 3 uh, had minor minor scale similar to the first event, and unlike the first event from well two, the, there were many scales found inside the pipe too, and it covered most of the pipe. Similar to to well two, the mixing header, the mixing point, there was found a thicker scale and it covered almost half the inside the pipe diameter. And it decreased to 8 centimeter at the downstream area before separated line. Then those scales were then taken to a third party for an analysis. For well 2, which has a steady condition, it has undersaturated condition. And based on XRB results, the scale was formed in amorphous, amorphous and rhodochrosite mineral. For well 3, scale was formed as amorphous, rhodochrosite, and tetrahedrite. Since the pH was normal, uh, neutral, the discovery of rhodochrosite mineral here may be caused by bed flow when the well was shut in. For two page header, when well one and three mixes with well two fluid, pH increased bigger than the pH in well two. This condition enhanced the precipitation of silica and other minerals when in individual wells, the low pH of well two helped back the precipitation then it form, it formed the position when the um, when the temperature of well two is below saturation temperature or high pH. The position of silica can be enhanced also by the presence of metal as cation. From XRF data, as we can see here. It was dominantly contained silica dioxide and manganese, di manganese oxide. The silica is the largest one that deposited as a result of low solubility. Manganese oxide is the second largest content in scale. It can be derived from content of casing material mixed with acid production fluid or reservoir rock rich. Both of these components can cause a bond of metal silicate. In this case, scaling is in the form manganese silicate. This is possibly due to injection by the caustic soda. As I already mentioned earlier, well 2 was injected due to neutralize the acid properties. The excessive amount of injection may lead to the form of rhodochrosite mineral. Then we move to discussion. First, we need to observe the temperature as it is an essential parameter for silica saturation index and it should be maintained above the saturation temperature. For this case, average temperature 
in each well is above 180 degrees C, and all wells uh, are in under saturated condition. This is the simulation that uh, we run based on flow rate ratio from well pack A. This produces pH mixture of 5.8 with assumption no caustic added. If we add caustic into well 2 and set pH to 5, we have pH mixture to 6.42 and it gets increases when, when we set pH of well to higher. Then, based on metal silicate approach, in this case, we use rhodochrosite as, we, as it was discovered before from inspection. Actually, manganese is not common in geothermal. Usually, it is prevalent relative to other cations such as magnesium, calcium, iron, and aluminum. So for total pH 6.42, 6 it is already oversaturated at high temperature. Higher pH also increases the potential of reducrosite deposit. Then pH setting at certain temperature becomes an important parameter in formation of this deposit. This is what may cause the scale to be deposited at the two phase line. Thus, pH monitoring in the two phase header was needed to maintain mixture pH below 6. Based on simulation, then I use geochemistry workbench here. This is the temperature and pressure saturation reference for operating in well pack A. For untreated well, well 2 pH, 2.7, it is still safe operating above 150. For we set the well 2 pH higher, the mixture pH will also get higher, and temperature and saturation pH pressure must, must also be set higher than in lower pH. So this is the summary of this study, that scale in two-phase header can be occurred when low pH mixed with near-neutral pH well into the same header or mixing point. The scale deposition were delayed at acid well, since silica saturation index is below 1, and low pH helps make the precipitation. And when it comes to to phase header, the pH increases. Precipitate scale due to enhancement of metal escapion. And future work related to thermodynamics data should be done to ensure the formation of the metal silicate. So we can have recommendation that operating temperature must be set higher than 175 degrees C. Otherwise, scale deposition can be formed. Operating temperature must be maintained over saturation temperature. Then, pH modification. Eliminating the use of caustic injection in this case uh, that will lower the combined pH fluid of the three wells to 5.8 and it will reduce the potential of metal silicate deposition. The pH checking in the downstream to pass header before the printer must be carried out to ensure that it is already completely mixed and maintained below 6. Then other options are the addition of scale and corrosion in inhibitor since we have acidic fluid and neutral pH mixed with the acidic fluid. I think that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention.
PT Kogindo Daya Bersama adalah perusahaan ketenaga listrikan di Indonesia yang beroperasi di seluruh wilayah Indonesia dari Sabang sampai Merauke. Kogindo didirikan pada tahun 1998 sebagai anak perusahaan PT Indonesia Power dan bagian dari PT PLN Persero. Kogindo memiliki empat bidang usaha, yaitu suplai energi, jasa operasi dan pemeliharaan pembangkit listrik, jasa gas dan diesel engine, dan jasa maintenance, repair, overhaul, MRO. Dalam kurun waktu lebih dari dua dekade, kami telah mengembangkan bisnis kami secara signifikan dan membangun dasar yang kokoh bagi portofolio perusahaan di level nasional maupun internasional. Kogindo menawarkan satu solusi layanan terintegrasi di bidang ketenaga listrikan melalui Kogindo Integrated Solution. Dengan menggabungkan kompetensi, teknologi, dan pengalaman, kami yakin dapat membantu para pelanggan mencapai efisiensi dan keandalan pengoperasian pembangkit listrik di Indonesia dan seluruh belahan dunia. Kogindo, Trusted Partner for Power Generation.